Shalom everyone and welcome to Bits of Torah Truths and we are on the Simchat Torah series, the Joy of Torah and we have just started a new cycle of the Torah readings and we are in Parashat Bereshit we are in the, the first Torah portion in the Torah in Genesis chapter 1 through 6 or six, chapter 1 through 6 uh, verse 8 Okay, and so I titled this week's study, The Beginning of God's Creative Work is Separating the Righteous from the Unrighteous. And so this week's reading is from Parashat Bereshit, and it contains some of the most significant actions of God, which sets the stage for all of Scripture. And more specifically, we're told the first thing the Lord does in creation, in his creation, is to separate the light from the darkness. And the question is, you know, what is the significance of the Lord beginning his creative process by separating the light from the darkness? What do you think? What is so significant about that? You know, it's possible that in this description of the creation events, the Lord God is laying the foundation for not only the definition of a day, but to say that the beginning of his ways is to make a distinction between light and darkness as an illustration for the beginning of his work in our lives is to make a distinction between righteousness and unrighteousness. And in the creation account in Genesis 1, the Lord describes the separating between light and darkness as the day and night and that it is very good and he specifically calls the light good but does not state that the darkness is good and he and that you know that follows through with this idea that uh, the light and the darkness refers to righteousness and unrighteousness and that righteousness is good and unrighteousness is very bad and the Torah portion uh, the following verses also add an additional context to this separation process that the Lord is is uh, is performing. In Genesis chapter one, verse six through eight, it says, "Then God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters." God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. And then in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 and 19, it says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser night to light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Okay. And so in Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, the Lord continues his separation process of creation by separating waters from water. And note how the scriptures speak of the waters which are from above and the waters which are below. And this may be an illustration on the water vapor found in the sky as opposed to the liquid water that is found in the earth. And the scriptures again are setting the stage for describing the power of God his ability to make a division and a distinction between the things which are from above to those things which are below. And as we had studied in Parashat HaAzinu a few weeks back, Moshe described heaven and earth as bearing witness and to let his testimony be as the rain which comes down from the above. And the illustration was that as the Torah is from since the creation, of, from, from since the beginning of creation, even before creation, that um, being with God in the beginning, the Lord sends his Torah from heaven to earth. His instructions in righteousness comes from above. And the Lord separates the heavens from the earth, and there is light and there is darkness, morning and evening. Isn't that fascinating? And notice how all of these things are connected 
how the creation account is drawing these things into the context of one another. In addition, based upon these scriptures in Genesis chapter 1, four, verse 14 and 19, another key distinction the Lord is making is that of the creation of light did not extinguish all darkness in, in all places, but rather that there were places for both light and darkness, just as day does not annihilate or do away with the night. Note how in the heavens the Lord placed the stars to be sources of light within the darkness. And in a similar manner, he places us in the midst of this present age to be a light for truth and righteousness and justice in the darkness, you know, in this, this wicked world. And so it's really, really fascinating how we can, we can draw such a significant parallel to these opening verses in, in Parashat Bereshit. The significance of Parashat Bereshit and these observations is that we learn of the creation of the world, the creation of man and woman, the fall of man into sin through disobedience to the command of the Lord, and the mercy and grace of God to forgive man of his sins. The importance of these introductory chapters to all of Scripture is that the Lord is making a distinction between light and darkness, which has its parallel to, begin it to the beginning of God's ways and the difference between good and evil, righteousness and unrighteousness. And based upon these first few verses, the Lord separating the light from the darkness, a great amount of doctrine, theology, and literatures have been developed over the centuries. The separation process described in the creation account cannot be understated. This week, this week, let's study what the Lord is trying to tell us regarding the beginning of his works to separate the light from the dark and that it is very good and how this is related to righteousness and unrighteousness. Okay. And so the verses we're looking at is in Genesis chapter uh, 1, verses 1 through 5. I see a typo here. Um, but it says the following. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the fa surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Okay, so... Studying the first chapter of uh, Parashat Bereshit, the one thing that we may observe from the creation account is that the Lord separated the light from the darkness, that the Lord separated the expanse of the waters, and then he placed light, these lights within the expanse of the heavens in the midst of the darkness to be signs for seasons, for days, for months, and years. And if we draw a parallel to the light and the darkness and to righteousness and unrighteousness, the Lord calls and places us within the darkness of this world to shine forth his truth, to speak into the darkness to the unrighteous of the righteousness of God and of his love and his mercy. And what a wonderful illustration the Lord is drawing here in the context of the creation account with regard to the calling the Lord has for his people to live, to love, and to reach out for the lost. You know, what, do you, what do you think? you agree? And the rabbis, you know, when we look at uh, what the rabbis have to say, they have much to say concerning the creation account. And so I chose a few select uh, commentaries on, uh, on the, the creation account to illustrate this point. And uh, one was from Shalach Teruma Torah Or, chapter 51, and the other one was from Midrash Rabbah Bereshit, the second Parsha in part 5. Okay, so in Shalach Teruma Torah Or 51, it says the following it says, um, prior to the creation of the universe, there existed only God and his name in total and absolute secrecy, a concept which I have explained elsewhere at length. Once it had become his will to bring into existence a universe, the Torah first speaks about um, Bereshit bara Elohim, and afterwards the Torah refers to Biyom Ose Adonai Elohim, and this shows that the four-letter name of God re 
remained secret in only the name Elohim, which has the same numerical value as the word for nature, was revealed. I have already mentioned that the creation of the universe proved that God's existence before the universe. God's existence is manifest only through his activities. The essence of God, by definition, remains head hidden. Anything revealed must, by definition, have previously been concealed. The very name of God, which alludes to uh, Haya, uh, Hava, Vayahi, I think that's how it's pronounced, um, it says something, and it's, a, it's the breakdown of the Tetragrammaton um, in Exodus. But um, the very name of God alludes to something that was and will forever be, and is the cause of any existence, and enables all that exists to continue doing so. And this is why the verse quoted from Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, does not merely describe God as having created the universe in the past, but also as an ongoing process. Okay, and that was Shilach Teruma, Teruma Torah Or 51. And in Shilach Torah Or on Parashat Teruma, the commentary points out that the only one that existed before the creation of the universe was God and his name in absolute secrecy. And the commentary continues and it says that the Torah speaks first saying, and we know the very first words in, in the Torah, Bereshit Bara Elohim. Okay? And uh, it says, then afterwards, the Torah refers to, and it says, Bayom Os Asot Adonai Elohim. And the Torah Or says that uh, there's a difference between Ose and Asot, meaning that uh, Ose is a reference to having been created, and Asot is referring to an ongoing process. And this is all in relation to the work of God in his name, that before the creation his name was secret, and after the creation of the Lord and his name are revealed in his works, or in his activities in this world. The interpretation is that the Lord is the one who enables all to exist and to continue to exist, where Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 indicates that the creation process is an ongoing process. And so the idea here is that the Lord is revealed in his, act, his activities and that his creating and sustaining work is an ongoing process. This sustaining process may be described as his separating the light from the darkness, which we try here to parallel to righteousness and unrighteousness, which is also an ongoing process. In addition, remember the rabbis say that the world existed as a result of the tzedekim netzirim, or the uh, the hidden righteous ones, or the lamed vav tzedekim, meaning uh, the 36 righteous ones. And the point is that the Lord is continuing his creative process of separating the light from the darkness even to this day. If the Lord was not continuing this aspect of his creating pro creative process, the world would end. And based upon this observable world, we know that the Lord's process of separation is continuing even today in his Messiah Yeshua, in which we find the fulfillment of his promises to our fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in each person that he calls out of the darkness and into the light. And um, Peter, in his epistle, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he uses this analogy. And so... Um, He's saying that the Lord has called us from unrighteousness into righteousness in the Messiah Yeshua, in Yeshua. And um, we know that, uh, prophetically speaking, that Jeremiah 31, 31 to 37, that uh, the Lord, by his Spirit, writes his Torah on our hearts. You know, and so he's making us righteous, and he is helping us and empowering us to live righteous before him and uh, you know it's a really really awesome thing and so this creative process the separation process is continuing even today and Midrash Rabbah Parashat 2 part 5 it has the following to say concerning the creation account and it says Rabbi Avahu and Rabbi Chaya uh, Rabbah Rabbi Abahu said from the beginning of the creation of the world, the Holy One saw the actions of the righteous and the actions of the wicked. This is what is written. 
For the Lord, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Now the earth was astonishingly empty. These are the actions of the wicked. And God said, Let there be light. These are the actions of the righteous. But I do not know which one of them they desired. The actions of these are the actions of those. Since it is written, And God saw the light that it was good, he desires the actions of the righteous and not the actions of the wicked. Rabbi Haya Raba said, From the beginning of the creation of the world, the Holy One blessed the Holy One saw the Holy Temple built, destroyed, and built. In the beginning of God's creation refers to it built. This is what it says to plant the heavens and to found the earth. Now the earth was astonishingly empty refers to it destroyed. This is what it says I saw the earth and behold it was void and unformed. And God said, Let there be light, refers to it built and complete in the future to come. This is what it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has shone upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and a gross darkness the kingdoms, and the Lord shall shine upon you, and his glory shall appear over you. Okay, and uh, Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 2. And, and there, there are multiple references to the, uh, the scriptures, to the Tanakh. In, in the Midrash. And notice how um, Midrash Rabbi Bereshit states that from the beginning of the creation of the world, the Holy One saw the actions of the righteous and the actions of the wicked. Okay, so the rabbis also recognize the significance of the Lord separating the light from the darkness as a reference to the need to separate the righteous from the unrighteous. The point they make is that the Lord saw the differences between the two and thus began his creation by the separation of the two. And note the differences when comparing the righteous to the unrighteous, that there is no congruency, you know, that righteousness and unrighteousness are contradictory terms, and both cannot exist together. One will be at war with the other if they are both kept in the same vessel. And the separation process is bringing order into one's life in the same that was needed in the beginning. And the same can be said by for the purpose and the reason for obeying God's Torah is because it is laying down the rules for life. We are, we are bringing into order our lives. You know, We are ordering ourselves according to God's ways and it brings Him glory. And we do so because we love Him and because of what he has done for us in the Messiah Yeshua. And this, um, the rabbis describe the actions of the wicked in the Midrash as being empty, whereas the actions of the righteous are called, let there be light. And if we seriously examine our ways today, can our actions and thoughts be described as the light or righteousness of God? Do you, do you or have you seen differences in your life as a result of your faith in the Messiah? Something that comes from within that is not of yourself, but that which is of the Lord working and doing and changing and creating in you something new? You know? And if it is, praise God. You know, praise the Lord. If not, then do you need to... You need to um, Reevaluate what's going on in your life, and and repent, and ask Yeshua into your life, into your heart. Ask the Lord to send His ruach, His Spirit, into your into your life to change you. And then the rabbis they parallel the actions of the righteous to the building of the temple, and the actions of the wicked to the destruction of the temple. And the rabbis conclude the midrash saying, "Arise, shine." For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has shone upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and the gross darkness the kingdoms, and the Lord shall shine upon you, and his glory shall appear over you. And so the separation of the light from the darkness is paralleled to the glory of the Lord shining on his people. The light, as opposed to the kingdoms of the earth that dwell in darkness, or unrighteousness. And so again, it's possible in this description of the creation events that the Lord is laying the foundation for not only the definition of a day, 
but to say that the beginning of God's ways is to make a distinction between light and darkness as an illustration for the beginning of his work in our lives, to distinguish between righteousness and unrighteousness. From when you placed your faith in Yeshua the Messiah, the question is, are you seeing a progression towards righteousness in your life? Do you seek out the ways of the Lord, or do you seek out your own ways? Do you seek out sin? You know, I think that is a very, very important question for this process of self-examination and teshuva for repentance. I think I believe that we, we all need to, to live repentant lives on a daily basis. And based upon Parashat Ha'azinu, the Torah of Moshe and all of Scripture was given to us in a form that we can understand and comprehend. And in the Torah, we are told that God's instruction descended from heaven at Sinai and took upon himself a language that we might listen, that we can listen to, understand, and obey. The Lord gave commands and statutes that we, so that we would be able to speak his word and apply his word to our lives. When we walk in God's ways, we allow God's word to be clothed in human flesh. And the instruction which was in heaven, in the beginning with God, descended from heaven to earth like rain, as we were reading in, um, we had discussed in Parashat HaAzinu. And the rainwaters, uh, they supply life to every living thing on this earth. And water, which is an essential element for life, is a part of every living thing. And note how the instruction of God is paralleled to rain. And that we live in the Word because it nourishes our souls. You know, our souls are thirsty. And we drink in the, the Word of God, which is food, you know. And there, there are so many parallels here just from these first few verses in the, the Torah. I believe that these scriptures are, are literally are setting the stage for all of God's creation and His creative work in our lives. And the main source for the instruction in righteousness comes from the Torah of God. Now, in the opening verse in Psalm 78, Psalm, uh, Asaph states that, uh, he says, Listen, O my people, to my Torah, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. He says, Torati. He says, my Torah. And that we are to listen, incline the ears to the words of his mouth. The word Torah is derived from the root word le yurot, or yura, meaning as a verb, to shoot, or to cast, or to throw. Is an ancient form is to, um, to throw. And the verb is used having a meaning to shoot an arrow and to hit the mark. And that mark was the object being aimed at hitting, and therefore the word Torah has the meaning of, the meaning of hitting the mark. And in the books of Moshe, the target is truth, God's truth, and how one is to understand the differences between truth and falsehood, how we are to draw near to the Lord, and how to relate to God. And based upon the derived meaning of the word Torah, the aim or goal of the Torah is to teach us the truth about the Lord God in heaven, the creator of the universe. And with this sense of the word Torah, the meaning of Torah is direction, teaching, instruction, or doctrine. In addition, with the knowledge that the Torah is God's instruction for his people, we may conclude that the typical translation of this word as law is not quite accurate. And note how the Aramaic Targum translates the psalm in Psalm 78 verse 1. It says, A teaching of the Holy Spirit composed by Asaph. Hear, O my people, my Torah, Incline your ears to the utterances of my mouth. And so the rabbis translate the words of Asaph as being inspired by the Holy Spirit and as the instruction or teaching of Asaph that is inspired by the Lord God himself. The Targum, the rabbis, uh, are in agreement with this interpretation of the word Torah, meaning the instruction of God. And while studying the Septuagint, a statistical analysis of the Greek text reveals that the most common way the word Torah is rendered is by the Greek word nomos or nomo. And the Greek word, the Greek text uses the word nomos in a variety of ways, one of which is law, 
However, nomos is not limited in its translation to mean law. For example, in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Listen, my son, to my father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Here, the Septuagint translates... Uh, it uses a translation, it uses the word thesmos, and the word thesmos means instruction. In a similar way, within the apostolic writings, the authors render the Hebrew word Torah as using the word nomos or nomo, where in some instances it is more appropriate to translate nomos as God's teaching or instruction rather than law. And there are two Hebrew words that are derived from the same root, as Torah, and one is more, and the other is hore, and a more is one who imparts instruction to his or her students, and a hore is a reference to a parent who teaches an instruction and instructs his or her child. As a result, these things of these things, the word Torah takes on a greater meaning than simply the law, and. In addition, Judaism uses the word Torah in a very, very broad sense. And for example, sometimes the word Torah is used to describe the Talmud. In other instances, Torah may be a reference to the Oral Torah, the Mishnah, you know, etc. And so, according to the, the sages, the Oral Torah was communicated to Moshe on, on the mountain of Sinai, and Moshe wrote down the written Torah, the scriptures. The Oral Torah was transmitted orally through the generations until Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi authorized for the Oral Torah to be written down due to the destruction of the Second Temple after se following 70 AD in Jerusalem. And the writing of the Oral Torah is called the Mishnah. And the Mishnah was completed approximately 200 CE. And following the writing of the Mishnah, the sages began to write commentaries on the Mishnah and the Torah in the, Mas in the Masoretic text. And these commentaries are called the, the Gemara, the Gemara was combined with the Mishnah into one work called the Talmud with other commentaries, you know, Rashi and Tosefta is a commentary on the commentary, you know, and um, there are there are two Talmuds. There's the Babylonian Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud. The uh, Jerusalem Talmud was completed approximately year 400 CE. The Babylonian Talmud around 500 CE, um, the Common Era. And or A.D. and today Judaism, for the most part, in Orthodox Judaism, considers the Babylonian Talmud to be more authoritative of the two Talmuds. And as a result of the communicating of the sages, uh, discussions in written form, the writing of the Mishnah and Judaism's use of the Talmud for hundreds of years, the Talmud is considered to be the Oral Torah, the same Oral Torah that was revealed to Moshe on the Mount of Sinai, and therefore carries a great authority. And as a result of these, these things, it's important to study and to know the Mishnah and the Talmud. And as we have seen in this study thus far, learning about the interpretations of the rabbis may help to interpret and understand many passages in Scripture, uh, their application to our lives and for understanding the apostolic writings. The important point to remember while studying the Mishnah the Talmud and the rabbis is to understand that these are interpretations of the scriptures and interpretations are always open for debate on their authoritative nature. And that is why we find while reading the Talmud that there are, each rabbi has a differing opinion. You know, and some agree, some don't, you know. And so um, these interpretations are always open for debate. The written scriptures, however, should hold a greater spiritual authority over our lives the written word of God, the Tanakh, and the apostolic writings. And the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, he said that, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that not, no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. And in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6, the point he was making is to not exceed what is written, that is, the written scriptures, the Word of God. And remember, the Mishnah and the Talmud would not have, had not been written for hundreds of years later, and Paul was not making, therefore, a reference to these works. Okay? And in addition, the word Torah has been applied as a reference to all of Scripture, and even Yeshua himself used the word Torah within this context. John chapter 10 verse 25 to 30, 
when Yeshua answered his opponents, referencing Psalm 82, verse 6, saying, It is written in your Torah. And so, he uses the word Torah to refer to um, all of Scripture, Yeshua does. And this is one one New Testament reference where Torah uh, is, and nomo is used, uh, interpreted as instruction. Yeshua demonstrated the word Torah may be used as a reference to the entire Bible and not just the first five books of Moshe. And as Yeshua demonstrated, the word Torah may be applied as a reference to all of Scripture. Therefore, this term should be first and foremost as a reference to the books of Moshe, but we may also use Torah to speak of all of Scripture. And the idea of the all of Scripture as referring to Torah is that all of us are to be yielding our members to our Father in Heaven and to Yeshua the Messiah. And this is... Um, I guess I, I kind of diverged a little bit here to discuss these things regarding um, the meaning of the word Torah, but um, the idea here is that we are to yield ourselves to the and our members to our Father in Heaven and to Yeshua and Messiah. Like Paul said in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, offer your body as, as living sacrifices. Okay, And this is what it means to live righteously before God, you know, and to to uh, obey the moral imperatives and and to seek to draw nearer to Him, to the Lord, and uh, to know Him. And the, the manner in which we do these things is to be obedient to the command. And this was and is the purpose of the Lord giving His Holy Spirit to His children to empower our lives and to help us to overcome sin. Overcome sin is synonymous to being obedient to commands since sin is by its very definition disobedience. And so the idea of this, of the Lord separating the light from the darkness and Him separating the righteous from the unrighteous is that He is working in our lives through His Spirit and causing us to have a heart and a mind for Him and for His glory, to live for Him and to walk in His ways. You know, and this this is a, a continual ongoing process that we see I, I've seen in my own life that I'm continuing to um, live you know, more of my life is living for him and less for me. You know, it just seems like this this is the ongoing process that that God is doing in my life and I I think that he does that in the lives of all believers, you know, in the Messiah. And the Masoretic text states in Psalm 78, verse 8, And not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart, and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Asaph states that the generation of people did not establish or make firm or prepare their hearts, and they did not have faith in his spirit, in God's spirit. And according to the psalm, it's possible to prepare the, the heart. And this was something the rebellious generation failed to do. And in the text, the psalmist draws a parallel to the one who has not prepared the heart and the one who has faith. In Parashat Bereshit, the beginning of God's creative work is this separation process in our lives, bringing us out of the darkness and into the light, as Peter said in First Peter chapter two verse nine, he is taking us out of unrighteousness and bringing us into his righteousness. And the Lord is speaking to us, and He is going to work a mighty work in our lives that we are being told to prepare our hearts and our lives for God's moving, for His creative process. You know the power of God, and having faith or believing is to take God's word to understand it and to apply it to our lives and this is the meaning of the Lord separating us unto his righteousness the important point of the study is that um, we can take home that we can take home with is um, let this be the beginning of the preparation of our hearts before God and to be sensitive to spiritual things this year, you know we're we're in a new series of reading through the Torah. You know, try to be more sensitive to spiritual things. 
dig deeper into God's Word. Study and remember His Word. Have faith. Be thankful for His covenant and seek to apply His Word to your life. The application of the Word is a changed life. And it, this is what it's all about. You know, I believe this is what it's all about because of um, His mercy and grace that He is working in our lives to change us and to, to make us into uh, the image of His Son. You know, so um, that concludes the Torah study for uh, this week on Parashat Bereshit. Does anyone have any comments? Uh, I'll release the mic here.